On this episode, we travel to Hong Kong where we learn about the Harbor Loop. Then we take a look at Hong Kong's system of elevated walkways. We find out what Hong Kong is like for pedestrians. Finally, a pedestrian talks about challenges for people with disabilities in Hong Kong. Stay tuned. We're in Hong Kong talking with Alex Brazier, who's creative director with Lead8. What is Lead8? So Lead8 is a, an architecture and design studio. Um, we started up in Hong Kong a couple of years ago. Um, we do a lot of mixed-use retail-based developments and transport-based developments, which means creating spaces for people um, with maybe a retail element, a residential element. Um, so mixed-use architecture. What is the Harbour Loop? So the Harbour Loop is our kind of, it starts off as a, a CSR initiative for us as a company in a way to m use our skills, our creativity, our design skills to make Hong Kong a better place. Um, so the big vision is to create um, a 23 kilometre loop around the harbour front, um, which really is about connecting people with what is Hong Kong's best asset, which is this fabulous harbour front environment. And run a nice little uh, you know, promenade along mm. the harbour here. Uh, how much of the harbour front has an existing access and, and how much would still need to be built? Um, I mean that's the interesting thing about our proposal, there's actually quite a lot of the harbour front which is um, either existing or planned, um, but it's all done in quite a fragmented manner, um, which means there's often sections like this which are quite nice and pleasant, but they're maybe a little bit inaccessible or difficult to get to, or they just go to a dead end and they don't connect up with another element of the harbour front. One side of the harbor is Hong Kong Island, and the other side is Kowloon. Uh, how do you connect the two halves of, of the harbor loop? Um, we've actually got two ideas of how to do that because the big vision for us is creating that loop. It's uniting um, Hong Kong Island with, with Kowloon. Um, at one end, the eastern end of the harbor, we're proposing a, a pedestrian and cycle only bridge, so traffic free. Um, which means we can design a nice, elegant structure. The, the costs are a lot lower as well because it doesn't have to be as a, um, intense a structure as perhaps a traffic or train bridge. Um, and at the western end, uh, we're proposing a cable car connection which goes from the CBD district straight across to the, the emerging cultural district. So creating a very strong um, cultural link to the city um, outside of just the harbour loop itself. I imagine both you know, a high bridge or a cable car would have fantastic views when you're up on that part, uh, you know, looking over at the city. Yeah, that's entirely it. I mean, we're looking for a, a strong pedestrian or user experience. Um, and I think those, those two solutions, those design solutions, offer something which is interesting, perhaps just to tourists, but residents as well. Um, we've done our research in terms of what we need to achieve um, in terms of clearance. So we're looking at a 60 metre clearance to allow the biggest cruise ships and cargo ships underneath. So it won't impinge on any of the, 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 the marine activities in the harbour. Um, and the other very positive aspect, certainly of the bridge itself, is it creates an actual physical gateway to, the, to that end of the harbour. So this end of the harbour, we've obviously got the two big towers, IFC and ICC, which bracket the harbour in, in kind of the sense of goalposts. And there's nothing at the eastern end. So we see it as a, a design solution which offers something for the identity, the physical identity of the harbour in Hong Kong as well. And, you know, the trail's great for getting around the harbour, 23K, that's a pretty good day's hike for someone. Yeah. Uh, what are you doing in the way of connecting it to the communities it passes by? So our idea on the harbour front, um, the harbour loop if you like, is to create what we call hubs along the way which are pause points. Um, now these can offer maybe facilities like dining facilities, changing facilities, bicycle, bicycle storage, bicycle rental etc. Um, so create a real kind of destination in themselves and we're locating these at key points where they can integrate with the existing residential or professional communities who exist there. So it's not just about considering the harbour loop as, as getting people to the waterfront, it's about connecting with the existing communities through these hubs. And you got this great idea, you've drawn up some plans. Uh, who's in charge of the harbour front? Who do you need to talk to to make this happen? Um, in Hong Kong, um, I mean obviously all land is owned by the government in Hong Kong, so there's a government element which we're going to have to um, 
uh, approach at some point. We've actually talked to them informally at the moment and they're very supportive and interested in the idea. Um, and there's an organisation called the Harbourfront Commission which exists at the moment to just look at Hong Kong's harbourfront. Um, and they've actually got a vision which is very similar to ours in terms of a long-term objective. Um, which is really positive to hear. So obviously we're looking strategically to be working with them in the future. Um, and I think part of what we can bring is perhaps that kind of objective, innovative approach and using our design skills and our creativity to offer something to them which perhaps they don't have or isn't a particular strength of theirs at the moment. We're in Hong Kong talking with Paul Zimmerman. What do you do here? I'm an uh, elected councillor and I'm a volunteer in my time as the chief executive of a uh, advocacy group for uh, better planning. And that involves uh, a lot of um, road and transport issues. Does that include pedestrian issues? Uh, absolutely. I mean, uh, walkability, public space uh, are, are very critical in a high density city like Hong Kong. Uh, also, uh, where our road network is extremely limited and we have a high density of number of vehicles per kilometer road. Uh, the fight for space in that road reserve and trying to safeguard the space for pedestrians is, is a key battle. And one thing I've seen in Hong Kong, probably more so in most cities I've been in, is the number of elevated pedestrian walkways. Uh, what role do they serve and uh, what, what makes them work well or work not so well? well I guess it, the first ones that were built were uh, one was connecting a private property to the post office across the road and was a lot of traffic in front of the post office and so I guess there was a, there was a gain there that was both for the private developer and the uh, and to try to get people across the road to the post office easily. Um, the next one was a, a footbridge between two private buildings that's really developers gain but these days uh, you know we have to get secondary networks into uh, very congested districts because there's just not enough space at peak hours at, at street level and we need additional capacity. Um, and so in a number of districts, we now got a very extensive elevated walkway networks, and not just the walkways, but um, mezzanine floors and buildings, and um, in, in, in central uh, garden spaces that are all connected through this uh, uh, labyrinth of, of walkways. And behind us, we have a pedestrian bridge that perhaps didn't manage to replace the ground level. What's the story on that? Well, I mean, that's, yeah, that's the issue that, of course, another reason why we have these footbridges, and if you leave it up to the highways department, they put footbridges just to try to keep people from interfering with the vehicular traffic. And those are standalone footbridges. They don't work very well because people try to avoid the, the level changes and, and run across the road. So this one here is a typical example, and there's a, there's a tram in the middle and people were expected to go up stairs, take the footbridge and then back down again just across uh, two lanes of road. Uh, nobody was doing that. So uh, you know, we had to kind of survey that, video it, photograph it and put it up to government and say, this is silly, why don't you just keep you a ground level pedestrian crossing? And uh, after a lot of pushing, we got them on both sides of the road back. So now people don't have to go up to the footbridge. And that's, that's throughout, I mean, we've had refusals of putting pedestrian crossings back at places because there is a footbridge. Otherwise, people wouldn't use the footbridge. But that's, of course, a silly argument. Another uh, one that uh, I've taken you to at uh, uh, Nathan Road, which is uh, the main tourist drag in Chim Cha Toy. It took us 10 years to get a crossing back between the main tourism drag and the waterfront. There was no way to get to the waterfront other than through a labyrinth of tunnels. Um, because the secondary network in Chin Cha Choi, as I've shown you, is, is, is not um, an, a footbridge network, but it's actually a tunnel network. But that's so complicated, you, don't, you get lost so easily. Uh, plus there's a lot of little level changes, so people with, that are in wheelchairs or uh, some, someone that have disabilities, uh, they find it very difficult to, to get across. So anyway, 10 years later, we got the crossing back. You know, these things, you've got to keep fighting them one by one. So the key where it works well is where there's a lot of stuff on that level and you're not just going up and down for a single crossing. Is that one of the key features? No, absolutely. If, if you want people, you know, if you need elevation, elevated uh, 
uh, connectivity because segregation, because we have some highways that run through the center of town. I mean, Hong Kong is a unique city. We've got a harbor and we have uh, reclaimed land around it and then you got mountains. So we don't have our ring roads in the mountains. Our ring roads are kind of sitting around the harbor and, and they, they can be segregating. The new ring roads have been on underground, but the old ones are sitting there and, and they're segregators. The second reason to have elevation, the requirement for elevation chases and, and other networks is because of crowding and congestion. Now, people don't like them. If they stand alone and you're kind of forced to make detours and forced elevation changes. But the moment they become comprehensive secondary networks, then people start liking them because then you have a choice. You know, the weather is nice, you stay at ground level. You want to have a direct route to stay at ground level. It rains. You take the elevated network system, you may have to do a few detours, or you have a lot of time and you want to do some shopping as well, you take the elevated network system. So then actually it contributes to a pedestrian choice and then it's very good to have an overlay of a secondary network. We've seen it in, it, that they've tried it in other cities, but as soon as your um, density of people Goes, goes below a certain threshold. If you put it in these kind of elevated network system, they can cannibalize the street level and the street level becomes ugly and nobody wants to be there except for the drunks and the druggies um, and the cars. Um, but if there's, if, there's, if there's a good amount, uh, if you're above a certain threshold of density of, of people and, and movements, then these things work very, very well. And that's what we have seen here in Hong Kong. Um, We've seen secondary networks working in other cities, of course. I mean, you've, you've probably been there, Toronto, Montreal, but that's really a weather thing. Um, weather counts in Hong Kong a bit when it rains, because summertime it can rain. Uh, it can be very hot and sticky. But uh, you know, normally people will always use the ground level unless they have a good reason to use the secondary network. And if it's attractive and there's parks, sit-out areas, shops, I, I call them door handles. The more opportunities there are, um, people start enjoying them. We're in Hong Kong talking with Gavin Coates. What do you do here? I'm a senior lecturer in uh, landscape architecture at the University of Hong Kong. What, uh, what's Hong Kong like for pedestrians? Uh, well, actually, Hong Kong is, is a very pedestrian city. The uh, car ownership in the city is only about 6% or something like that. So the public transport system is amazing and it's quite well connected. So from the point of view of pedestrian connections, it's quite good. Uh, the thing is that um, really is the whole pedestrian system is simply designed to get from A to B. So in that sense, it's quite efficient. But in most cases, especially in the older urban areas, you know, it's actually quite unpleasant experience because the footpaths are much too narrow, very crowded, um, uh, and uh, it's extremely uncomfortable to walk around, although actually you can walk around and the vast majority of the population do walk around as a matter of course, but it's not always a pleasant experience. Um, which brings up an interesting question. Is there a difference between a walkable place and a place where people just do a lot of walking because they have to? Uh, uh, yes, I think so. I mean, it's interesting that we use this word walkable because um, there, there are different types of walking, right? And there's uh, just tearing through the city to get from A to B, which is what we tend to do here. Um, uh, or there's the walkability. I mean, are you walking purely as a transportation function or are you walking to enjoy the place? and not many people walk around in Hong Kong to enjoy the place and most people are rushing from place to place and in fact you try to minimize the time that you're outside because the streets are uh, or the footpaths are very narrow and crowded and it's hot and uh, it's just you just want to get to where you're going so there isn't so much opportunity for sitting around and just enjoying the place what uh what sort of things could be done to sort of improve the experience so someone might want to actually linger a little bit in the public spaces rather than just uh, hurry along to where they're going? Yeah, because it's not just a question of that there's not much space and you're hurrying from one place to another. There's also a question of safety because when you're walking, uh, you have to watch the footpath, you have to watch where you're putting your step. 
because many of the footpaths are, um, I mean, actually they're reasonably good in Hong Kong perhaps compared to many places, but you still have to watch out that you don't trip over some uh, uh, loose uh, piece of pavement or a curb or whatever. Uh, and of course, when you're crossing the road, you have to look out for the vehicles. So you're concentrate, your eyes are concentrating on your own self-preservation self most of the time. What, uh, what could be done to, 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 to improve conditions for pedestrians? So it's not just a, uh, you know, a chore to be out walking. I think that um, in particular in the older urban areas, it's really just a, simply a question of widening the footpaths making the footpath space much wider and, and reducing the, the, the vehicular carriageway. I think that this is the key thing. I mean, the whole city would be so much more usable, so much uh, more enjoyable if we just had a... If, if, if just one lane was taken from the vehicular uh, carriageway on each side of the main roads. And that would give space for more tree planting, it would give space for people to sit uh, uh, and still have space for people to walk to walk by. And that would encourage people to, you know, in, in, give, give the opportunity to enjoy the environment you know, uh, rather than just rush through it. So that, that's really, I suppose, and some of the narrower streets should be pedestrianised completely. Of course, you have to allow for emergency vehicles and deliveries and all these essential, essential functions that you have to get vehicles in from time to time. But um, overall, you know, the, the, the priority should be on the pedestrians, not on the vehicles. And even though the number of people, the car owning, you know, the vehicle owners are in a tiny minority here, um, it, it seems that everything is designed for the benefit of the vehicles uh, and pedestrians are shoved out of the way because pedestrians can get out of the way so um, of course to provide for vehicles is much more difficult so you need more space uh, pedestrians can change direction very easily and, and uh, um, so they, they in, a, in a sense that's almost taken advantage of <laughs> what uh, you know with pedestrians and transit users being you know 90 95 percent of, mm -hmm. of, of the movement in the city uh, do pedestrians get 90 percent of this road space so how how's the ratio for actually how much they get versus what, what cars uh, they, get they most definitely don't get uh, that the, the, the amount of space the pedestrians are in I would say most of the streets would be in like 15 to 20 percent uh, if you take um, Hennessy Road for example it's a hundred feet wide, and the pavements are ten feet wide, and uh, well, they're thirty meters wide, and the footpaths are three or three point five meters. So, the pedestrians are in twenty percent or less of the space. Uh, I mean, if we go, if we had a look at that road now, you would—it's it, actually an enormous because it's a Sunday. Uh, there isn't much traffic anyway, and so you've got this enormous space, uh, and the pedestrian space is just along the edges. You know, by, by, the, by the buildings. So there's a tremendous, there actually is an enormous amount of space, but it's all, uh, if it's given over to vehicles, it's still unusable to pedestrians, even if there are very few vehicles, because it's not just the vehicles themselves, but the threat of a vehicle coming that makes the space unusable. One thing you see a lot more of in Hong Kong than, than you do in most cities uh, the ports of the city, there are elevated pedestrian walkways. Uh, how well do those work? What are their shortcomings? Um, yeah, because Hong Kong, uh, uh, by its nature, is, is such a vertical city, and so the pedestrian areas are not just on the road level, but as you say, on uh, elevated footbridges, and also on uh, many underground tunnels. and. Um, uh, now these have certain advantages if you're a pedestrian because most of the footbridges have a roof, right? So, uh, so that keeps you out of the sun and out, out of the rain. And of course, if you're underground, you're out of the sun and out of the rain. Um, uh, the problems with them are, of course, changing level. For pedestrians, changing level is very arduous. 
So um, Hong Kong must have more escalators than anywhere, I think. But, uh, but still, even with an escalator, although it's not much physical effort to go up and down, it's still a bit inconvenient. And if there is no escalator or no lift, then it's extremely inconvenient and pedestrians are very reluctant to do it. Um, and the other thing is that, uh, so it's kind of, you, the, other, the other thing is uh, knowing where you are. You can't find, to, you know, you can't see the landmarks if you're in the, uh, in a footbridge, not so bad, but if you're an underground, it's very difficult to work out where you are in the city. You can't see any of the landmarks. And so uh, you, you, don't, you can't see the direct pedestrian link between where you are and where you want to go. Uh, and this is very confusing. And it just adds to the general sort of dissatisfaction. Uh, you know, the, yes, the links are there, but if you don't know them, then it can be very annoying and frustrating. You can't even cross the road just to get to a building that you can see is just, a few, you know, few seconds walk away so they're, they're a mixed bag yeah but I would I think that they they don't however many footbridges there are and however many tunnels there are uh, they they will never negate the importance of the street at ground level you know, uh, that's still uh, very relevant to our use of the city We're in Hong Kong talking with Gillis Heller. What's it like trying to get around Hong Kong for a person with a disability? Okay, well, I mean, first of all, I, my disability is I have a torn muscle in the leg. So uh, I'm on two crutches, elbow crutches. Uh, so I'm not in a wheelchair. I'm not just, you know, with a single cane. So four things. Uh, one is a real lack of seating. Uh, compared to any city in the United States, uh, particularly my hometown of Seattle, uh, there's just not a lot of seating uh, available to the public where you want it. Uh, number two, no shelter from the rain. It rains only six months a year here, but when it does rain, it pounds down rain. And uh, th there's not that much shelter. It, it's almost as if they act as if there's no rain. Number three, wet marble. Uh, the lobbies of a lot of buildings are very polished marble. Even the airport is very polished marble. It's very dangerous to walk there with crutches because very small uh, imprints. Uh, if you don't have them perfectly vertical, they'll slip out right from underneath you. You'll go down on your face. Uh, fourth thing is uh, ups and downs. There's, there's a lot of, it, I think that there, there was a lot of flooding in the old days, and so there, a lot of buildings have one or two steps up. Um, in a wheelchair, that, that makes it impossible. Um, I'm heavier than most people here, so people don't just pick me up and, and put me inside. If I'm in Russia or something like that, people just you know put, put me inside very easily. Uh, but here in, in Hong Kong, I'm too heavy. Uh, no way am I going to get inside. With crutches, it's still, it's still pretty hard because one of the legs is, is very weak. Uh, so yeah, ups and downs. Those are the four things. And are, are new buildings, new construction, uh, you know, getting better than you know the large existing building stock? Right. I think the new buildings are better in terms of ups and downs. There's there's no ups and downs, or there's a ramp. The building code in Hong Kong for new building is actually quite strict, uh, almost ADA. Um, you know what ADA yeah. is? Yeah, Americans yeah. with Disabilities Act. Right. Okay. So it's almost ADA here in Hong Kong. There are no automatic doors like you find in, in uh, well, at least in Seattle, you know, buttons that you, you push to open the doors. But uh, most of the rest of Hong Kong's new construction is practically ADA. But what they have in addition to ADA is a lot of marble flooring. So um, just Murder Incorporated. And Hong Kong has a lot of elevated walkways. Uh, how does that work for someone like you? I, I don't use them. I just can't. Uh, I used to use them all the time. It was a great way of getting across the street. Now um, I, I spend a lot less time walking. I, I, I am in my car. Uh, I have a car and a driver, and that, that just gets me from point A to point B in, in any appreciable distance. Who, uh, you know, who's responsible? What will it take to you know, get the improvements in the, in the four areas you talked about? I'm not sure how, you know, which department of the government is in charge. Uh, Lands Department has a lot of, of say about how 
the, the land is, is laid out, the buildings are laid out. Um, I believe that the Chief Secretary was speaking in, earlier in this conference. I, I did not attend, but uh, she certainly is uh, on the right path to making improvements in Hong Kong. If I were to come back to Hong Kong in 10 years, what would you like to be able to show me that's an improvement over what we've got now? Ah, a lot more seating. I hope that there's seating at bus stops. There's no seating at bus stops yet. I hope that there's seating at the main public square in Hong Kong. There's no seating in the public square. I, I hope that there is uh, more shelter from the rain. And I hope that there's uh, more mats on the floors of, of marble lobbies. Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org.